What's going on, smart people? My name's Dylan Dant. I'm a physicist from a land down under. Physicist. I can never say it because I used to have a list when I was younger. So today we're watching JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I've had a heap of comments suggesting this show. So let's check it out. I'm going completely blind. I have no idea what this show's about. I haven't even heard of it. But we're going to look for some physics and science, break down some stuff. So you, Kimi, are Jonathan Joestar. So his name's Jojo Joestar. That's almost as lame as my name. Did you know that a pregnant horse actually runs faster than a non-pregnant horse? Because it has two horsepower. No, but in all seriousness, this actually reminds me of something incredible that I saw. Um, and there's a real patent for this. This is a real invention. And it's the delivery of a baby using physics. <laughs> so using the centrifugal force, which is the outwards force in a rotating reference frame. So you lie a lady down on this spinning tabletop thing. There's a, a net to catch the baby. And then you, you spin the circle top thing. So if the baby's stuck, you can use this device uh, to spin the pregnant lady around and it delivers the baby. I don't know about this guy's abilities, but there is something I can bring up that is relevant. And, you know, if the guy who wrote all of this stuff knew about it, he might have actually been able to work it in there. Because there's something called the dynamical Casimir effect, where if you move a mirror, the mirrors fast enough, you can actually produce light from them from seemingly nothing. So this dynamical Casimir effect, you take these two mirrors, take them into a vacuum, you move them at very fast speeds, and you've got these, well, you should have nothing in between the mirrors, right? You'd think there's nothing, it's a vacuum, but you, there's always quantum fields, and you've got these fluctuating quantum fields in between the, these two mirrors, and the way we describe these fluctuating quantum fields is using virtual particles. So when they fluctuate, they create these virtual particles, which come in pairs and they exist for such a short time scale, it's like they never really existed. So we say they don't violate the conservation of energy. But there are other ways to think about this. And these virtual particles might not actually be real. It really depends on how much you trust the math. They're just kind of a way of calculating things. So some people think they definitely exist because of this, and some people think it's just an artifact of a math trick. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to... I know it's confusing. But, you know, it, it, a lot of things like this in, in physics might be physically wrong, but it's just a way to think about it. So I disagree with people saying, oh, we shouldn't tell people this because it just confuses everyone. But anyway, so you've got these virtual particles popping in and out of existence, which might not be really popping in and out of existence. You can also think of this a different way as well. This is just one way which might not be really physically what's going on. So what's happening when these plates, these mirrors are moving at a really high speed and these a pair of particles pop into existence is that one is lost because the, these mirrors are moving so quickly. And so when that happens, one of the, the pair that's left behind becomes a real particle and that's the photon. And that's why light is emitted when you move mirrors very quickly. Now you might also think this sounds like bull, but we've also experimentally verified this with just moving a mirror very quickly, a small mirror, and generating microwaves. So if you listen to all that, you might think, well, does that mean a vacuum is not really empty? Like we always say it is. And that's exactly what this suggests. It suggests that there's some type of energy in the vacuum always. And some people call it a zero point energy. Some people call it a vacuum energy. And it might be an infinite source of energy, which doesn't make a lot of sense. You also might recall that Einstein told us that mass and energy curve space-time. So if there's an infinite amount of energy, well, why isn't there a bunch of curvature? An infinite amount of curvature. Well, this is just another 
paradoxical thing in physics that we don't understand. It's an open problem in research. Just another reason for you guys to get interested, get involved, you know, change the world, change our understanding. Who knows what devices we could create if we understood something like this. If there really is infinite energy just floating around in the vacuum, well, that is essentially a free energy source. A lot of sci-fi books talk about this uh, zero point energy and they use it for all sorts of crazy nonsense. <laughs> I bet so many people think that after clicking on this video. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> I know my name's Dance, but this dancing is almost as bad as my dancing. Look at that. That's like, you guys give me shit about, you know, there's no real physics in these shows. Did you see that? That that was real physics right there. Look at that eyeball. Wait, where was it? Take that. Real science. Faster than light, huh? Let's talk about it. I know you want me to talk about it, so we're going to talk about it now. Is this possible? Could you travel faster than the speed of light? Let me explain. So first, a quick comment. Where we, C in physics is the speed of light, but it's also the speed of causality. If you turned on a light at some point in space, someone really far away wouldn't know that it turned on because the light travels at a finite speed. It takes time for that light to travel through space to get to the other person. But it's not just light that has a constant speed. Change also has a constant speed, which just so happens to be the speed of light. It is how fast you can ever know that something really happened. Because if something was to travel faster than the speed of light, stuff gets really weird when you try and think about it. And you know, it, do it doesn't really make sense to even think about it because it might just be meaningless. But we're gonna think about it anyway. Theoretically, if you were able to travel faster than the speed of light, you would reverse cause and effect and nothing would make sense and things would start to happen backwards you essentially travel backwards in time now i don't think that makes a whole lot of sense to even consider like i think that's pretty meaningless because we know our current understanding is a generalization our current understanding breaks down at the limits of nature particularly inside black holes it completely breaks down all predictability is gone so I don't think we can exactly speculate using these average models. And when I say average, they're amazing. Like, you know, they've given us the world we have today. So no one should ever call them average. They're incredible. But you can bet you there's going to be a bit more complexity under the hood of this cosmos. And so I'm not sure that you can just speculate like that with our current understanding. So let me give you an example of how causality breaks down if you're able to travel beyond the speed of light. So say our planet had this special death beam thing that could travel beyond the speed of light. We didn't like this planet over here, so we shot this you know, death beam at it, traveling at one and a half times the speed of light. So it arrives there in half a year, right? And it would then blow up. So in our reference frame, it would make sense. The universe works. Now in your reference frame from your perspective if you're mov moving fast enough relative to me what you would witness is that this planet that we didn't like blows up and then you'd see the death beam travel backwards the death whatever we called it the death beam travel back to my planet and then i'd press the button do you get it so you'd see the effect and then the cause you'd be seeing things backward in time let me quickly show you what happens mathematically if you try and travel beyond the speed of light so here you've got an expression. It's just the energy of a moving particle. So where it says V, let's replace it with 1.5 times the speed of light. So 1.5 C. 
And what happens? You get the square root of a negative number. What's the square root of a negative number? It's an imaginary number if you've done some math. Just an FYI, we represent the square root of negative one as an imaginary number i. So that's it, right? You can't do it. Well, what happens if you have a particle with an imaginary mass? Now you might have heard of something called tachyons, and no, they're not just something in science fiction. It actually comes from theoretical physics. So let's talk about them for a second. So we're gonna to have to take the math that I think is probably gonna end up being wrong, very literally beyond its limit, where it's, I think it's no longer meaningless, I mean, meaningful, but we're gonna do it anyway, and let's see how we get a tachyon. Well, in that case, you get I squared. That gets you back to a real number. I squared is negative one. We've never found evidence for something like this to actually exist, but we already have a name for it, and they're called tachyons. And again, if you're taking all this as you know a possibility, well then that does mean that these tachyons travel backwards in time. So if these things are real, there's also another interesting point, and it's that they can't go at the speed of light because then you'd be dividing by zero undefined. So what that means is nothing can cross this barrier of the speed of light. If you're a tachyon, you can only travel, you know, beyond the speed of light backwards in time. If you're anything, you know, traveling in our normal world through time, well then you can't cross that barrier. You can't travel at the speed of light or beyond it. <laughs> Jesus, that's me doing any physics experiment ever. So I've got no idea what this Harman stuff is meant to be, this Harman energy, but, you know, we just talked about zero-point energy, so maybe it's a zero-point energy, or aka the vacuum energy, if you come from Einstein's perspective, which, like I said, could be this infinite energy source, or we could have things very wrong, you know, very that could be it, you know, it could be, we could go into dark matter, dark energy, there's all sorts of things you could say, oh, it's that. A fun little fact about this zero-point energy, though, is... Richard Feynman and Wheeler, two famous physicists, actually once tried to calculate how much uh, zero-point radiation there was in the vacuum, and they figured out even a small cup of this stuff would be enough to set all the oceans to boil. It's intense. But in Einstein's perspective, this stuff would gravitate, and so it would spread out all throughout the universe and become weak. So... In summary, we don't know enough about this stuff. We don't know, I mean, we don't know enough about the universe to understand if this stuff is even real. So there's a lot of open questions here. Maybe I should use that for the end of my videos. What was it? <laughs> On that note, I think we'll end the video there. And uh, if you enjoyed that, leave a comment down under and make sure you like and subscribe. Help me help you live in a better world by, you know, getting more science to more kids. We can get them more interested in this sort of stuff because, you know, if you made it this far, I hope you learned at least something. And if you did, let me know what you learned down under. And I'll catch you guys next time for another random episode of DD's Bizarre Adventures.